So, uh, I'm Sebastian Beswick. Um, I work at a place called Domestic Cat Software. Um, we're a local design and development agency. Um, we build apps for uh, startups and large companies uh, here and in the USA. Um, we're actually hiring uh, iOS and Android developers at the moment, so if you want to build great apps, uh, please come and have a chat with me sometime during the conference. So today I'm going to be talking about requirements, uh, which actually feels pretty weird to me because uh, I'm, a, I'm a programmer. Um, and requirements are generally managed by people who don't think t-shirts, jeans and uh, thongs are appropriate clothes to wear to work. Um, but I've actually taken a, a quite a particular interest in uh, requirements lately. Um, and the reason is that I've had to work on more than my fair share of uh, projects over the last couple of years that would have really benefited from... Yeah, your microphone's off. Uh, thank you. Okay, try that. Uh, so, is that better? Yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I've been, I've, I've uh, had the misfortune to have to work on a whole heap of projects lately uh, that would have d benefited from uh, some more detailed or existent design specs. Um, so I work as a consultant iOS developer. Uh, so rather than working on a single app for a long period of time, um, I'm often working on a couple of apps at a time with new work uh, kind of always coming in. Um, now my company, Domestic Cat, uh, hired a full-time designer uh, at the start of this year. Um, which is great. I love him to bits. He's an expert in mobile UX uh, and he's a real pleasure to work with. Um, but because we're a pretty small shop, uh, we often have to work with digital agency designers. Um, has anyone ever had the pleasure of working with a creative agency designer before? Yes, yeah, so they tend to make me pretty mad. Um, creative agency designers are often overworked. Um, and they're rarely specialists in mobile UX. Um, obviously, when you combine this with a client that doesn't really know what they want, uh, things can get hairy pretty quickly. Now, I understand that apps are more than just a set of functions. Um, people don't only expect their apps to do what they're supposed to do. They also expect them to be a joy to use. Um, it's generally understood that when you're making an app, a functional spec is required. Um, but unfortunately, it's pretty rare to get a detailed design spec. So I put together a specification that uh, we can forward to our clients uh, and their designers that details exactly what I expect them to provide us to ensure that I have all the information I need to transform their app from a very abstract idea into a beautiful functioning product. Uh, now, this list of things is pretty big, um, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty vital that there's a clear understanding um, of exactly how an app should look and feel before development starts. Um, obviously, people judge apps just as harshly um, if they provide poor UI or UX um, as they do if they're functionally incomplete or buggy. So here's the list. Um, and you can see that I asked for quite a lot of information. Um, I'm going to spend the next 20 odd minutes uh, taking you guys through exactly what all these things are um, and why I think they're so important. Now having a designer assemble all this information takes a bit of time up front, um, but it's going to save a huge amount of time further on in the development process um, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, it ensures that I understand the experience that my clients want to provide for their users. Secondly, it ensures that I have everything I need to turn their idea into a beautiful, usable app. It ensures that my client isn't disappointed when I misinterpret how their app should look and behave. And finally, it vastly reduces the amount of time that uh, is lost through me regularly having to uh, get in touch to clarify things that aren't present or obvious in the designs. <clears throat> So now let's go through uh, that list of documents and assets that I think should be provided before development starts. Um, I think the first thing that needs to be mentioned is the basics of how screen measurements and coordinates work in iOS. In iOS, we use two standard units to represent uh, screen resolutions and coordinates. We obviously use pixels and points. 
um, different iOS devices have different screen resolutions. So the iPhone 3GS uh, has a screen at a physical resolution of 320 by 480 pixels, which is 163 points per inch, pixels per inch, sorry. Um, but Retina displays were introduced with the iPhone 4, uh, which runs at a physical resolution of 640 by 960 pixels, which is 326 pixels per inch, which is, is exactly double that of the 3GS. Uh, so to ensure that um, interfaces can be defined consistently between the two devices, um, we refer to screen coordinates and resolutions in terms of points rather than pixels. Um, so both the iPhone 3GS and the iPhone 4 have a logical resolution of 320 by 480 points, um, even though the iPhone 4 screen has doubled the uh, physical resolution of the 3GS screen. Um, drawing a line that's one point wide on a newer device um, actually results in a two pixel wide line being drawn on the screen. Uh, sorry, one point wide line. Um, the line's going to look the same on both devices, um, and this is the reason that we prefer to work in points rather than physical pixels. Um, the Paint Code team have made a great resource for explaining this, um, and they've put it on their website. Um, in the past, I've had designers give me uh, design documents that randomly flip between uh, <coughs> describing um, dimensions in pixels and describing dimensions in points. Um, and this is obviously really annoying because as developers, we only ever pretty much care about points. So now let's, uh, let's uh, talk through the documents um, that I think should be provided in the design spec. The first crucial document in the design spec is the design flats. Um, as a developer, this is the canonical document um, that you're going to refer to when you're working on the app. Um, this document should contain an image for each screen of the app uh, with real assets and either real or mocked data. Um, and each of these screens should look um, exactly how it's expected to look um, when the app's complete. So as you work through each screen of the app, um, you can regularly refer back to these design flats, um, both to the screen that you're currently working on uh, and to the surrounding screens for context. Um, and obviously, I find that having a single canonical source um, can be a real help in efficiently implementing designs. Um, so this is an example of what design flats for the dev world app would look like, um, and it's exactly what you would expect. It's just what the finished app looks like. <clears throat> the next document um, I think is important in the design spec is the annotated design flats. Um, so the last document we talked about, which were the unannotated flats, um, described what should be built. This document, the annotated flats, um, shows how the design of each screen should actually be realized. For example, um, imagine you've got a screen that just shows a single label. Uh, on the unannotated flats, um, you're going to get a very broad overview of where the copy goes on the screen. What we want to know from the annotated design flats um, is we want to really quickly be able to see the properties of the label. Um, for example, we want to see its exact position, its color, its size, and its font. Um, I consider this document to be really important, pretty much as important as uh, getting the image assets themselves. This document should be based off the design flats, um, and your designers will probably find that starting with a set of unannotated flats uh, makes it much easier to produce this document. Um, over the last few years, I found that many designers uh, want to provide me with just their raw design files, so Photoshop documents. Um, it's pretty unlikely that this is actually going to be very useful for me. Because uh, remember that, that um, many designers have different workflows. They use different tools. Um, and this gets unmanageable for developers really quickly um, if they work with a lot of designers, so consultants, freelancers especially. Um, as contract developers, um, we might have some design experience, 
um, but we generally aren't actually specialist designers. Um, and we also generally don't have the background to the app that the uh, designer and that the client does. Um, so this makes it highly likely that if we don't have an annotated design spec, um, not only are we going to waste time trying to figure out exactly what kerning was used in the text in that label, um, we're also going to miss things that probably seemed really obvious to the designer, like the fact that there was custom kerning on the text on that label. So there are two basic pieces of information that I think we should gather from uh, the annotated design flats. The first thing is the layout of the elements. So this is on each screen. Um, this is, this is uh, how each element should be laid out, both with respects to the bounds of the screen and to every other element on the screen. And the second thing we want to know are the properties of each individual element on the screen. So this is what we need to do to make sure that each element looks um, exactly the way that it should look. So very specifically, we want to see the following information. First thing we want to see is uh, the dimensions of each asset on the screen. So for each fixed or external asset, um, we want to know its size in uh, display independent points. Um, for example, if you have a logo, um, up the top that should be displayed uh, at a specific size. Um, that should be made clear here. Um, next thing we want to know about is constraints. So even if we're creating an app specifically for um, an iPhone running iOS 9 in portrait mode only, um, there are still a whole bunch of device resolutions that we need to support. We need to support the iPhone 4S size iPhone 5 size, iPhone 6 size, and iPhone 6 plus size. So if a designer only provides designs in the native resolution of uh, an iPhone 4S, say, which is 320 by 480, um, there's going to be a huge amount of padding that has to be introduced somewhere uh, when the app runs at, uh, on an iPhone 6 plus, which is at a much higher resolution. So rather than specifying the raw dimensions of the design based on a single uh, iOS screen size, um, I think it's, it's much more useful for designers to provide guidelines on uh, how the element should um, react when they're running on, on differently sized devices. Um, so you can see here, um, we've specified um, uh, a whole heap of fixed constraints. Um, this is just in, in uh, constraints in X. Um, and we've also specified that this is where uh, the growth of the cell should happen. Um, should always be greater than or equal to eight points from uh, the chevron. Um, and any text that can't be crammed in there should be truncated. <coughs> Um, so obviously, as developers, if we aren't provided with this information, um, we use our aesthetic judgment and our knowledge of the iOS HIG um, to try and come up with a sensible solution. Um, but often it's not the solution that the client necessarily thinks is the best. Um, and once, we, once we've actually implemented this, uh, it can often be a, a significant amount of work um, to, to uh, change designs. Uh, so it's, it's really best if this information is provided up front. <clears throat> Next thing we want to know is information about colours um, in generic RGBA. So as developers, we could use a colour picker on uh, all the elements to get the colours from the flats. Um, but this is time consuming for us and it provides a lot of potential for uh, errors to creep in. Um, so it's best to have this specified um, in the design document ahead of time. Um, an important thing to note is that Xcode uses the generic RGB color space profile to draw colors. Um, so it's important that you let your designers and clients know uh, to set their design software to use this too. <coughs> Um, font information should be marked up uh, in the annotated spec. Um, and there's a few things that we want to know here. We want to know the font family for each piece of text. 
we want to know its weight, um, its style, its size, and its color. And having it presented like this means it's really easy uh, for developers to uh, uh, set, set details uh, when we're implementing. Um, the next thing we want to know is um, any external resources that are being used. Um, so you can see here that there's a couple of external images on this screen. Um, and they've been marked up with their file names. Um, another important thing to note is that it's really good to use sensible file names if you're a designer. Um, and to make sure to include um, details for, um, for example, um, deselected and selected states. So you can see um, there may be different images used for the selected and deselected states uh, of those tab bar images down there. And the last thing that I want to see in the annotated design flats um, are details about loading states. So this is what we should show on the screen um, when the app's waiting for a response uh, from the API. Um, it's also really handy um, to give details about what should be shown in response to an API error um, and what users should be blocked from doing um, during loading and error states. Um, the next document we want is a screen flow document. Um, as a developer, it's really crucial that we understand uh, very early in the development process um, how all the different pieces of the app fit together um, so that we can ensure that when we create our project and start work, uh, we're laying a, a, a solid architectural foundation for the app. Um, so this screen flow document should show um, all the different ways that users can navigate uh, between screens in the app. Um, for example, say you're working on a shopping app. Um, after a user successfully makes a purchase, um, your client may want them to be returned to the home screen of the app rather than just one screen back uh, in the nav stack. Um, and this document is the place to make all those uh, transitions clear. Um, also, um, if as developers we have this information early, um, we can often use our experience in uh, mobile UX to offer suggestions um, to designers that are maybe less experienced um, that will uh, possibly improve user experience. Um, we want a specification of custom animations. So in iOS, some animations actually come for free with the operating system. Um, but generally, animations, are, um, they, they definitely can be time consuming and difficult to implement. Um, so they really need to be specified in advance. Um, obviously, um, when you transition between screens, um, iOS gives you um, out of the box animations for those transitions. So for um, pushing, popping, presenting. Um, and we're used to seeing these in every app, we expect them. Um, however, if your client wants uh, a custom animation, um, either um, on a single screen or as a transition between screens, um, you really need to know this in advance so that you can allocate time um, to implementing it. Um, additionally, if uh, an animation or transition is um, non-trivial, um, it's generally best to also ask for a, a video or a mock-up um, of exactly how your designer expects this um, animation or transition to look when it's complete. Um, another thing worth noting is um, if you're using standard iOS elements, um, for example, the flat buttons, um, then affordances such as touchdown state and disabled state um, come for free with the operating system. Um, and it's relatively likely that they're going to continue working um, between releases of iOS as well without requiring extra development work. So, a little earlier I said that I can't use Photoshop um, and that I don't have a use for designs in their raw form. Um, but I was kind of fibbing, I can use Photoshop a little bit um, but I generally don't tell people that because it only ever causes me trouble. Um, 
obviously it is really useful if you have raw access, if, if you have access to your raw design files. Um, for example, the designer you're working with might have missed cutting, it, cutting out um, an asset, they've gone on leave, um, it may be easier for you to just fire open Photoshop um, and get the asset yourself um, rather than waiting for them. But obviously, again, this is dependent on um, the design tools and flow that your designer uses and whether you're, you have access to those tools and you're experienced enough to use them. Um, but having raw design files can help. It's good to have the option. Um, it's important to know about fonts in advance. Um, iOS ships with a large number of free standard fonts. Um, if your clients use any of these, um, you won't have to ask for font files because they're already installed on every iOS device. Um, there's a full, a full listing uh, at that URL on the screen. Um, if your client uses any uh, non-native fonts in their app, um, they should provide them as TTF files only. Um, it's possible for us uh, as developers to use third-party tools to convert uh, between font formats, uh, but sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, it generally causes hassle. Um, it's best if they're provided up front. <coughs> so designers generally um, understand what's required, um, read the design of an app icon. Um, but I think there's still a few additional bits of information that you can pass on to ensure that you're both on the same page. Um, obviously, before an app can be uploaded to the App Store, um, the icon files have to be embedded in the bundle. Um, if an app is missing any of these icon files um, or screenshots for the App Store when it's uploaded, um, Apple will just reject that upload. Um, so it's important that your designers know that corners are automatically rounded on app icons. Um, Apple applies this effect so they won't have to. Um, and transparency isn't supported at all for app icons. Um, any transparency in an app icon um, will be rendered by iOS as solid black. Um, Apple maintains a list of exactly which um, icon files should be provided um, for each device. Uh, that your app might be running on. Um, and I recommend that um, you provide this link um, to your designers and clients so that um, they, can, uh, they can see exactly um, what images they're supposed to provide at which resolutions. Um, the splash screens, obviously the first thing that your users are going to see um, when they open your app. So it's important to get this right early. Um, apps generally appear to load faster if they use uh, 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 <coughs> if they use a, a, a blank version um, of the app's UI, um, just as if it hadn't finished loading its data yet. Um, you're going to need to ask your clients and designers to provide you with a version of this for every screen resolution that their app supports, um, including landscape on iPad. Um, minus 20 points at the top for the status bar. And again, um, Apple rejects apps um, without launch images. <coughs> Finally, a suspiciously long way down this list um, is the actual digital image assets. So obviously your client's going to need to provide you with um, a set of external image assets that are used throughout the app. Um, which is every image um, that's used on every screen of the app. Um, so to, pause, to support all the major uh, iOS devices, which now I think all have uh, Retina displays, um, we require images at two resolutions. We need them at, at 2x and at 3x. So remember the iPhone 5 has a Retina display that runs at 640 by 1136 pixels. Um, which we access at a logical resolution of 320 by 568 points. Um, so if we add a button on one of our screens um, of size 30 by 30 points with a custom icon, um, the icon image is going to be displayed at, at 2x red in the resolution, uh, which is 60 by 60 pixels. Um, when it runs on the iPhone 4, 5, or 6, 
Um, and it's going to be shown at, at 3x resolution, uh, which is 90 by 90 pixels on the iPhone 6 Plus. <coughs> um, fixed animations in iOS are <coughs> often done um, using a, 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 a set of still uh, ping images um, where each image contains exactly one frame uh, of the animation. Um, these images should be named sensibly um, and they should be suffixed with their sequence number. Um, for example, we want to see animated button 1.ping, animated button 2.ping, uh, all the way up to the end of the sequence. Um, it's also handy as uh, developers to know the animation period. Um, for example, we want to know that an animation should perform one full loop uh, exactly every two seconds. Um, and to make sure that your designers ensure that this period uh, is an integral fraction of uh, the screen's refresh rate, uh, which is generally 60 hertz. Um, finally, um, if your app includes any audio assets, um, obviously this is going to need to be provided ahead of time. Um, I generally recommend that uh, any audio is provided in AAC format. Um, however, audio design is complicated um, and this may not be the best uh, solution for your client's needs. Um, so, for example, if their app needs to play large amounts of audio, um, or they need to play multiple sounds at the same time, or they need audio rendered with extremely low latency, um, then it's, it's best to get in touch with them very early uh, to discuss the best way to proceed. If your client has these specific requirements, though, uh, they're probably going to be pretty uh, uh, on the ball about all that stuff. So, uh, now we've looked at everything, I think it's uh, kind of crucial to get in the design spec before development starts. Um, if you're a designer here today, um, then hopefully uh, you'll be able to, to put this stuff um, to use in your own workflows. Um, and for the developers, um, hopefully you've now got a bit of a better idea of the conversations that you can start to have with designers and clients um, before the development process starts. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks to the Dev World Committee for having me today and putting on another excellent conference. Um, there's a list of resources that you may find useful there. Um, the slide deck will be available online shortly. Um, and please uh, feel free to come and have a chat with me during the conference. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Um, do you find that giving them that wall to get past is enough for you to lose the job sometimes? Um, so the, the, the question was, um, is this design spec uh, possibly too much work? Uh, for uh, a client to be interested in dealing with you with. Um, I think it's, it's complicated and my boss has a bit of a different opinion to me. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, again, it, it, it depends on how desperate you are for the work. Um, I find that um, clients that don't want to provide this sort of information are generally um, not particularly desirable to work with. Um, and again, it depends on whether you're doing a fixed, co a fixed cost quote um, or a time of materials. If it's time of materials, um, then sure, if specs change, if this stuff isn't provided and it needs to be redone later, then um, you know that's fine because it's billable. Um, but if you're working on a fixed cost project and you don't have this sort of information up front, um, it can be quite risky uh, to take on that project because um, I'm, I'm sure um, you probably had experiences with, um, you know, specs changing, scope changing. Um, it can be a, it can be a big pain, um, but again, it's it's uh, I guess also client relations and um, kind of passing through this information in a in a more friendly format. Um, so, are there any? applications out there that make this process a bit easier, provide annotations? Um, for a designer? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so the, the question was, are there any apps out there that make this process easier for a designer? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm a developer, I'm not a designer. Um, I think that, so for example, Sketch. Um, Sketch makes a, a lot of this stuff um, uh, simple to generate and export. Um, are there any designers in the room that would like to take this question? Um, so I noticed you had a slide to explain resolutions from Quaint Code mm. and then went on to describe all the different resolutions you have to export. Have you ever used Quaint Code or any vector graphics to, get a, to avoid that problem? I haven't um, because I don't, I don't build designs. Um, I don't do design, I guess. Um, um, so we've, I obviously don't use paint code myself. Um, the designer at, at my office um, does use Zeppelin and he does use Sketch um, <coughs> and he does use uh, vector formats when possible. I guess for m me and us as developers, um, it's more annoying when um, we're working on a project and we receive um, an icon file at only one resolution and then we have to fight with um, tools that we don't really understand um, to make that work um, and resize that. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, there's plenty of tools available. So the, the question was, I think, um, uh, how strict do we have to be about getting these specs beforehand and how strict do we have to be with demanding that they're perfect before development starts? Right. Um, and it's an excellent question. And the answer is obviously not strict at all. Um, I guess this is, this is a really basic starting point and having designers um, and developers think about this sort of stuff um, beforehand is, I think, where most of the utility comes from. Um, obviously, it takes a long time to develop an app. Um, when, you're, um, when you're working on a project, there's, there's always edge cases that um, uh, designers miss um, and that don't actually come up um, until often the app is, is uh, being used by real people. Um, so as it's being developed or uh, it's suddenly being filled with real data that doesn't fit. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely important to keep that uh, line of communication quite open and quite um, uh, amenable to uh, modifications as they need to come up. Um, but it is really annoying um, when none of this sort of stuff has been thought about um, by the design team beforehand. Great, all right, thanks everyone for coming. I think we'll wrap it up. <laughs>